They're trolling us at this point, aren't they? They almost have to be, right? The guy who said Subprime is contained is getting a Nobel Prize in economics because Subprime wasn't contained. How in the hell do you get from one to the other? That's really the question. It's not just some academic thing, nor is it some kind of, you know, seeking revenge or some kind of reckoning on Ben Bernanke. It really tells us a lot about what's going on. And there's, there's more to it than giving Ben Bernanke a Nobel Prize. It's trying to rewrite history so as to avoid accountability. That's what's really going on here. And it has implications that span not just you know finance and money, but economy, politics, and everything else. Giving Ben Bernanke the Nobel Prize is ridiculous. But it's not just ridiculous because, of course it is, the, the guy who presided over the worst financial crisis. Ah, see, I did it. There it is. I said the word that they want us to say. The guy who presided over the worst financial crisis. Financial crisis. What is a financial crisis? Is that what really happened in 2008? Was it a financial crisis? Are we still experiencing financial difficulties in 2022? That's what that's what's important here. The worst the worst the use of the word financial when the word should be monetary. Now, I'm Jeff, this is Eurodollar University, and this is the place in the video where I tell everybody, remind everybody, if you're watching this on Emil Kalinowski's channel, you're gonna wanna go over to the Eurodollar University YouTube channel. If you're listening to this on Apple or Spotify or any of the podcasts outlet, you don't need to do anything. And if you're watching this on Eurodollar University, thank you for scrolling over to our channel there. That's where the videos are gonna end up in the future. Now, as I said, I'm Jeff. This is Eurodollar University. Today is a day, well, well, it won't live in infamy, but it's a day about infamy that should be more well understood in terms of history. Not just history, but history of what, uh, the history of what happened that explains how we got where we are today, which, if you've noticed, isn't in a very good place whatsoever. The world is as unstable as it's been in a very, very long time, and nobody seems to have any answer for it. And because the reason is because nobody is held accountable for what has happened. Least of all, those who were at least responsible for watching over what they told everybody they were so responsible for. Now again, today, is, what is today? The October 10th, which means Ben Bernanke, the announcement, uh, the, the Swedish central bank said that him and he, along with two other people, are going to get it a Nobel Prize for their work in identifying what went wrong in the financial crisis. Financial crisis, isn't that convenient? A financial crisis is not something maybe you would expect a monetary authority to be able to have much to do. And that's really the issue here. Again, it's about calling this a financial crisis and then figuring out what went wrong in the financial system from the perspective of a monetary policy official. But that's not really, I mean, that's not what happened here. And my point, what I want to do in this video is to make people understand why we would object to Ben Bernanke getting a Nobel Prize, because it's more than that. It's, it's a really understanding our situation. I know I keep saying that because I'm pretty frustrated, to be honest with you. After 15 years, everybody still looks at the Federal Reserve. When in respect, in this respect, even Ben Bernanke receiving a Nobel Prize is an admission that this is beyond the capabilities of the Fed. Now, they're trying to say that it's a legitimately beyond the capabilities of the Fed, but for our purposes here, that, that's sort of enough. And then we can really look into why that is and what that actually means. But even on its face, giving Ben Bernanke a Nobel Prize and saying, well, he identified the financial factors that led to the crisis and the lack of recovery thereafter, what they're really saying is, yes, this was beyond the capabilities of the Fed. So I ask, why the hell do we care about rate hikes from Jay Powell outside the near-term effects on the short run of the curve? That's what we're really talking about. What is the Fed actually doing? And if it's always pointing in the direction of financial, financial, then what's going on monetary? We think it's the Fed, but here we see a perfect example where the Fed is saying, no, not us. It wasn't our problem, it was financial. I'm going to use Ben Bernanke's own words here repeatedly because I want him to tell you the story 
of what really happened. What he doesn't really want people to to know or, p- or put these pieces together. And we're going to start in January of 2009. January 2009 was the worst part of the global financial crisis. Oh boy, there's that term again. Just when it was getting bad enough that the real economy in the United States around the rest of the world began to lay off millions upon millions of workers. Millions of workers around the world, tens of millions actually, were being thrown out of work for what reason? Well, it's interesting because by January 2009, remember, the Federal Reserve had already acted in ways we couldn't even imagine. Our pre-crisis selves, all the stuff the Fed had done by, by January 2009 were unimaginable by that point, including the swelling of the Fed's balance sheet the institution of overseas dollar swaps and TAF auctions, the former of which, the overseas dollar swaps, had swelled to almost $600 billion during the worst parts of the financial crisis. So here he is in January 2009. This is months after these, these dollar swaps had gotten to their maximum amount. This is a, almost a month after he announced a zero interest rate policy in the U.S. for the first time ever, along with quantitative easing in December of 2008. Here has been Ben Bernanke at an FOMC meeting in January 2009 saying, I am certainly very uncomfortable with it. And with it, he means another bailout of a major bank, this time Bank of America, a rescue operation for one of the large, wait a minute, why are we rescuing banks in January of 2009 if these overseas dollar swaps, the 600 billion, hundreds of billions in bank reserves are supposedly flooding the system with liquidity? Remember, the Fed called this the period of abundant reserves, abundant liquidity. Yet here we are, January 2009. I am certainly very uncomfortable with it, but for whatever reason, our system is not working in a way it should in order to address the crisis in a quick and timely way. What? Wait a minute, Ben. You did all of these things. There was a year and a half period there where the Fed was doing one thing after another, after another, after another, abundant reserves, overseas dollar swaps. In January 2009, he says, in private, our system is not working the way it should in order to address the crisis in a quick and timely way. That sounds, it sounds less financial. Sounds like something's wrong systemic. And you know, let's let's go back even further here. Let's let's go back to November of 2002. It was on the occasion of Milton Friedman's 90th birthday. Now, if you know Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz, they wrote a monetary history in 1963, at least that's when it was published, which basically said the Great Depression, it was a monetary thing. The reason it got to be so great was because the Federal Reserve didn't know what the hell it was doing, allowed the money supply to contract such, to such a degree, it caused this massive deflation, the likes of which we've never seen before. And that led to basically not just the Great Depression, but then what happened after the Great Depression in World War II, the biggest calamity in human history, all from the boardrooms of the Federal Reserve. And what Ben Bernanke said, now remember Ben Bernanke, in the 1980s forward had developed a reputation as the preeminent scholar of the, he was the successor to Milton Friedman, right? He was the preeminent scholar of the Great Depression. And so arrogantly in November, 2002, our Nobel Prize winner, Ben Bernanke said, let me end my talk by abusing slightly my status as an official representative of the Federal Reserve. I would like to say to Milton and Anna, regarding the Great Depression, you're right. We did it, we're very sorry, but thanks to you, we won't do it again. We won't do it again in 2002. What happened five years later? Financial crisis. Now you start to understand why they keep using the term financial because as Ben Bernanke arrogantly said in 2002, we've got all the rest of this covered. What else could it be? We know what we're doing. Thanks to Milton and Friedman, Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz, we have a good idea of what's going on monetarily. At least that's what we're saying. So it has to be financial, right? It has to be financial, but wait a minute. In December 2008, before the announcement on QE and ZERP, the New Yorker did a mag, uh, did, did a uh, article on the financial crisis, which by then everybody knew was the worst worst occasion since the, the Great Depression, monetary, not financial. And Ben Bernanke was quoted in this New York Ar- New Yorker article confessing something that I don't think most people have ever heard. I and others were mistaken early on in saying that the subprime mortgage crisis would be contained. 
the causal relationship between the housing problem and the broader financial system was very complex and difficult to predict. But what is it between the broader housing market, the broader housing problem, and the financial system? What is the thing that connects those two? Well, it just so happens to be the stuff that Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz talked about, above, about the bygone deflationary era. Maybe the issue isn't financial complexity, but monetary complexity. And who should we ask for a determination? Let's go to Ben Bernanke, February of 2010, long after the crisis is done. The Fed has supposedly rescued everything. Testifying in front of Congress, he says, liquidity, liquidity pressures in, the finan in financial markets. So here he's admitting, yes, financial markets are a problem, but what is the problem too with financial markets? Liquidity pressures in financial markets, and here's the big one, were not limited to the United States. And intense strains in global dollar funding markets began to spill over to US markets. In response, the Federal Reserve entered into temporary currency swap agreements with foreign central banks which we know didn't work because by January 2009, they're still talking, they're still dealing with a massive financial crisis? No. Do overseas dollar swaps, balance sheet expansions, PDCF, CCFs, all sorts of initialism programs the Fed did. The causal relationship between the housing problem and the broad financial system. Liquidity pressures in financial markets. Money. Monetary panic. This is not a global financial crisis. The global financial crisis was a symptom of, in Bernanke's words, intense strains in global dollar funding. Global dollar funding. Global dollar funding. That kind of sounds like something the Fed should be talking or should be doing. Isn't that what he was talking about in 2002 with Milton Friedman's birthday? We won't do it again. We won't let the dollar system, dollar liquidity, dollar funding get out of, out of hand in the same way that they had in 1929, especially 1930. Boy, no wonder they like to use the term financial because we could all see the financial symptoms on knowing that it was a monetary crisis. How do we know it's a monetary crisis? Let's go to Ben Bernanke in August of 2011. A second round of global dollar funding, intense strains in dollar funding markets. In August of 2011, the FOMC gets together. Mr. Bernanke again. I think a point that is somewhat un underemphasized is that our transition of monetary policy is an issue here as well. How can that be? Monetary policy. They've got at that point, as Brian Sack, the open market manager, open system open market manager, had said it earlier. They got up 1.6 trillion in bank reserves. They've got an abundance of reserves again for the second time in as many years. Abundant reserves. I think a point that is somewhat underemphasized is that our transition of monetary policy is an issue as well. So take an example: doing repos to keep the repo rate from uncoupling from the federal funds rate. Arguably, there are issues there relating to transmission. It's our indicator of the stance of monetary policy, but presumably we're aiming at financial conditions more broadly. Monetary disruption, de uh, de decoupling, quote unquote, monetary policy from financial conditions more broadly. Monetary comes first, financial then the symptoms. Let's go further. Again, of 2011. I think instead there are some important connections between what's happening in the financial markets and what's happening in the economy. First of all, financial markets are giving us information. They're telling us there has been a general darkening of mood and expect how can there be a darkening of mood? Ben Bernanke in the Fed says it's recovery. QE2, billion, trillions of reserves, money printing, liquidity. General darkening of mood and expectations about where the economy is going. Now, why is that? Interesting, right? The Fed has done two QEs by that point. Bank reserves have swelled to 1.6 trillion and financial markets are telling everybody who knows how to read them there is a monetary problem, a second one in as many damn years. Not financial. Financial is the symptom. The reason is because the Federal Reserve is not a central bank. And I could go on and on and on with these quotations 
But let's 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 get to let's wrap it up a little bit here. Ben Bernanke in 2015, he becomes you know he, he retires from the Fed. His first sentence that he writes in his initial blog post for Brookings: When I was at the Federal Reserve, I occasionally observed that monetary policy is 98% talk and only 2% action. I'm sorry, it's 98% talk and 2% bull, and he knows it. And the reason it's 98% talk is not because of a financial crisis. It's because the Fed does not take care of the monetary system that causes a financial crisis that spills over into the real economy. So the Fed did not do its primary task, which was to make sure the monetary system was okay, which is what Ben Bernanke promised in 2002. We've got the monetary system covered so that the financial system doesn't become an overwhelming mess that leaves us into a position sort of like the 1930s. Now, it's not as bad as the 1930s, obviously, but 15 years without legitimate economic growth is almost as bad. It is nearly as bad. And you can see the symptoms, the symptoms of, of such instability all around us. And what is really the issue here? Let's go back even further in time. One more time. One last quote. This is December of 1999. Ben Bernanke writing a paper. This, at this point, he's at Princeton. Uh, I think he's a special professor. Who the hell knows at that point? An academic. Uh, before he got to the Fed, talking about Japan and its lost decade, the deflationary decade of the 1990s. Um, foreshadowing. December of 99, Bernanke writes, Japan is not in a Great Depression by any means, but its economy has operated below potential for nearly a decade. Sounds pretty damn familiar, doesn't it? Nor is it by any means clear that recovery is imminent. Sounds pretty damn familiar, doesn't it? Policy options exist that could great re greatly reduce these losses. Why isn't more happening? To this outsider, at least, Japanese monetary policy seems paralyzed, with a paralysis that is largely self-induced. Most striking is the apparent unwillingness of the monetary authorities to experiment, to try anything that isn't absolutely guaranteed to work. So you can see from this particular quote, 1999, Bernanke says, when confronted with monetary disease that leads to financial instability, the goal should be to experiment if you have to, because that is the worst case. It wasn't the Great Depression, but operating below potential for nearly a decade. How about over a decade? How about a decade and a half where recovery is never imminent? And you can see in Ben Bernanke's record, from basically when he admitted subprime was not contained in 2007, all the way through the crisis and after the crisis. What did the Fed do? One experiment after another, after another, after another. So Ben was wrong again. In 1999, he said the problem is monetary authorities aren't willing to experiment. But in 2007 and 2008, monetary authorities were more than willing to experiment and it didn't make a damn bit of difference. Because the problem was not financial. The problem was these monetary authorities have no damn clue what they're talking about when it comes to the monetary system. So we have an unrestrained monetary debacle that then causes a financial crisis. Which, what, are, what, are the, what are the Federal Reserve going to do about it? What is the Fed going to do about a financial crisis when the issue is monetary? We know the answer is because, as they said in 2011, We've got all these bank reserves and we've got a liquidity issue on our hands anyway. They cannot solve the monetary crisis. So in, in the aftermath, in order to gaslight the public, they're making this all about a financial crisis. To the point, they're giving Ben Bernanke a Nobel Prize because he identified after, long after the fact all of these financial problems, leaving completely out of the public domain the real monetary root behind everything. So of course they're giving him a Nobel Prize because it fits with the last 15 and a half years of lies. Monetary policy, at least what's called monetary policy, is 98% talk and 2%, the other 2% that isn't, is complete, complete and utter lies. That's the sad reality and that's really what our major problem is we all think in terms of a financial crisis and therefore the monetary issue goes completely disregarded. And so we see today what's happening. 
Everybody, oh, QT, bank reserves. Sorry, bank reserves mean nothing. That, that much has been proven over and over and over and over again. You don't have to take my word for it. Take their word for it. All of these studies that show QE does nothing. QT does nothing. But yet we talk about it as if the Fed is the most powerful engine ever. And giving Ben Bernanke a Nobel Prize simply continues and forwards that narrative. That's how we'll know when these things are over. When we stop thinking about it in terms of Bernanke, but also thinking about it in terms of financial. It was the great monetary crisis of 2008 and the great monetary crisis that continues to afflict the world today. Just ask India or China or the UK. I'm Jeff. Thanks for, li thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Take care.